The Dice Tower, Episode 641, Short and Sweet. The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. This episode is sponsored by Renegade Game Studios. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. In today's abbreviated episode, we review a game, an app, and chat about health and gaming. I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Mandy Hutchinson. And dearest Mandy, (laughs) we'll go into it more at the end of the episode uh, when we kind of do a discussion topic, but... I thank you so much for pushing through and recording today. Yes, I hope my doctor is not listening because I'll be like, what are you doing? Let's just say I am not supposed to be sitting for prolonged periods of time. So lots of breaks are happening, but this is going to tie into our, I guess, end of episode discussion, if you will. Well, I'm, I'm very glad that you're here with me, but we will try to keep it, as the title says, short and sweet for you, if nothing else. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we did want to say thank you, everybody out there who has supported the Dice Towers Kickstarter for 2020. Oh, my goodness. It just went banana pants. If you did not see the short video of when they let Tom know, Tom and Mike and Z were all together, know that we had hit our goal. It's highly amusing. I think I I, I think I caught it a little bit. I've been in and out of, you know, doctor's offices and stuff, but... Was there like a, a lot of whoop whooping happening? Like what was what was happening? What was going Tom, on? I saw the reaction. I think Tom almost fell out of his chair. <laughs> and somebody <laughs> made this really funny image of Z focused in on Z's face where they basically said how to have eight emotions in five seconds. Cause Z's <laughs> face just gets very animated and goes through all sorts of emotions. It's adorable and hilarious. So Oh my goodness. Very much so. The Dice Tower is so grateful for your support. The Kickstarter ends January 31st, so you still have plenty of time to back at any level. I know that there's a lot of discussion about wanting to customize promo packs, and it really is true. It's just logistically impossible to to do that. And to make it even feasible, the amount the Dice Tower would have to ask for is untenable as well. So thank you to everybody for being a little bit understanding about that and really understanding the Kickstarter is about supporting the Dice Tower and the podcast and all the hundreds and hundreds of videos and all of the content and you know that we create trying to help support our community and grow our hobby and help you understand which games are for you and which games are not. Mandy, did you see the sneak peek of the playmat? I did. Uh, exciting stuff. I really like this year's theme of superheroes. Yeah, it's pretty cool. The upcoming playmat that I don't think has been fully revealed yet that with this superhero theme I'm I, I'm so excited to see it so even if you're not gonna back make sure you check out the playmat because it is rad absolutely but speaking of all the craziness and busyness you've been busy like what's going on I feel like you're you're you know have something interesting to tell us here because I feel like I haven't seen you so you've been busy what's going on I know and fair disclosure as as I always try to be very transparent about, I do support Restoration Games behind the scenes. I help manage their projects. And they are working on a Kickstarter for Return to Dark Tower, which I think actually might be live even as you're listening to this because it goes live oh, wow. on the 14th. Zoinks. <gasps> I hope I hope it's live right now. If it's not, uh-oh, something's yeah, gone trouble. wrong. <laughs> Zo- yeah, real. Thanks, Mandy. Yeah, no problem. Um, but yeah, I'm... I'm Excited for everybody to discover this amazing game that literally has been in progress for over two years. And I I just hope people fall in love with it and understand how unique it is in the market because it is 100% a singular product and a singular game. But we shall see. Well, I'm sure a lot of people are looking forward to it. I hope so. But Mandy, how are you recovering from your loss in our most recent <laughs> Aptastic episode, we're one and one now. I know. And, you know, going into that last one, we play Dragon Castle, if I'm not mistaken, was yep. the last one. I knew it. I just, I am not, I, I am not a winner in that game. And I thought maybe I could come back strong. I had some supporters there. Oh, she's coming back. Mandy's coming back. And, well, you ended the game. So that was abruptly, you know, halted, if you will. So now I have to 
recover and come back again in our next game. Indeed. Which is coming up in our next Aptastic episode on the Dice Towers YouTube channel on January 15th. And Mandy, what game are we going to be playing? We are going to be playing one of my favorites. And oddly enough, I've played this more in French than English, but Istanbul. And uh, this one is, I think the app is provided to us by Akram Games, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. And for those of you who have already tuned in, thank you. And you know that we have a process where we give out app codes during the show. So Akram has been quite generous with us this time with Steam codes, iOS codes, and Android codes. So if you want a chance to win a free app code for the digital version of Istanbul, make sure you tune in on January 15th. Enough chitter chatter, Mandy. Let's just get into it and let's hear about a game that you've played. So, what have you been playing lately? All right, so we're only talking about a couple of games this episode, just because we mentioned it'll be a little bit shorter, but I thought I'd pick one that I've played quite a few times, actually. So, Tribes Dawn of Humanity, and I believe you've played this one as well, Suzanne? Oh, yes. Okay, great. So we can kind of get both give a little take on it. Uh, designed, this is designed by uh, Rustin Hakenson, and artist is Klaus Stefan. The publisher is Devere and Cosmos. It's two to four players, and it plays in about 45 minutes. So the pricing on this one is about 45 Canadian and 36 US. And for those who haven't listened to the episode before, the pricing is uh, from online stores. So the Canadian pricing is uh, Board Game Bliss, which is online, and Cool Stuff Inc. also online. So this game, the mechanisms they list in this game is grid movement and tile placement. Tile placement is really big in this game. They classify this game as a civilization game, but basically doesn't take a long time. We're going to talk about that. It's interesting because I'm sure you have something very different in your mind as to how it actually plays, but we're going to come back to that. In the game, players get shells that they're going to be using because this is kind of like your currency, quote unquote. And uh, we have a layout of the board with some tiles and there's columns of tiles and we reveal the ones on the bottom. But in order for you to reveal the ones further up above each other tile, you need to complete one on the tile below it. So to start, you're going to have an opportunity to kind of start with one to begin with. We also have an area in front of us that have tiles. uh, I forget what kind of tiles they are, but they kind of connect together and they have different symbols on them. Like (laughs) there's one that looks like it has a bowl of noodles. I don't know if it's noodles, but that's (laughs) what it looks like to me. Um, One has a wheat symbol on it. One has, um, I can't even remember off the top of my head. They all have different symbols on them. And these are kind of uh, symbols you want to keep in mind because in order for you to complete those tiles I was talking about, you need to have them connected and you need to have population on those tiles. So in order to complete some of the objective tiles on the board, for example, one of the tiles might say, you know, it requires (laughs) three bowls of noodles. I'm just going to say noodles, okay, because I'm not 100% sure what it is. That meaning you have to have those tiles flipped up with people on them. So at least one person on them. There is another way to kind of meet that requirement, but that's the, the basic one at this point. So there are actions in the game that you can take. And at the top of the board, they have some bigger tiles, which kind of slide. So it's a random order that they start with. And some of the actions that you can take are population. uh, I believe another one is movement, uh, completing an objective. So some of them give you a choice on the tile. So it could be, you know, gaining population or completing an objective. Some are just completing an an objective. Some are just gaining population. Summer movement. Uh, what's the, there's another one, Suzanne. I'm missing. Um, I don't recall. I don't there's remember like peeking at tiles or revealing. I, I don't. Remember. That's it. You can draw it from the bag. There's a to get more tiles. Thank you. That was the other one I was missing. This allows you to go into into the bag and and grab more tiles. So these are just a few of the actions you can do. So it kind of reminded me a little bit of uh, Century Spice Road here because in order for you to to use an action of a tile that's kind of further down the line, you have to use your shells to get there. So the first tile is always free that you can use, and then you have to drop a tile for each one after that, depending how far down the line you want to go. So if you want the third tile, first one's free, but then you have to drop seashells to kind of get to that third tile. So you have to pay for it, in essence. And you only get so many uh, shells in the game. So unless somebody else drops shells, you're not getting any more back until you go to a tile where someone's taken an action and paid shells, and then you can get those back. So the reason why completing the objectives kind of tiles are important is because it helps build you up on tracks. So for example, remember I said there's a, a... 
there's an action that you can take, for example, of gaining population. So you want to get more people, right? Because you need to spread them out in order to complete some of these objectives. Once you've completed a specific objective, it's going to raise your level of whatever it may be. So in this case, let's say I'd finish an objective, it might raise my strength level, or it may raise my population, or it may raise my movement. It just depends on what it states on that tile. This allow potentially could allow me to move more, populate more, etc. I think you understand what I'm trying to go with. You start with the base, but completing objectives allows you to increase these things. So I played with my friend Ashley. She really seemed to like the population. She's making, making lots of babies so she can have lots of babies in the land and complete those objectives. Very smart move, I must say. Okay, so I guess you, I think you understand how it works. We have these little arrows in the game as well, too, because when you're completing objectives, you have to transcend in an upward fashion. So if you start on a tile on the bottom of the first column, you would naturally, once you finish that one, then you can proceed to finishing the next one. It flips over. So you don't know what it is before you do it. It just flips over. You may or may not have those tiles. You may have to take actions to get the specific tiles in order to complete the objective. But if you're like, I don't want to do that one, maybe I want to do the one diagonal to that one. We have these little arrows we can use, and you can only use it one time, and you can put those over up beside a tile, and it allows you kind of jaunt on over to a diagonal tile that you may be able to finish. So I thought that was kind of fun. Oh, I forgot to mention, points in this game are teeth. So <laughs> they're little yes. teeth. So, yeah. little teeth so when tokens. you complete an objective, you get your points in, well, as teeth. So the game ends, we have these uh, event tiles that come out and events can be good or actually pretty bad <laughs> for you or for the other player. And they go in the row of the actions. So it's one of the times you want to skip, but you got to spend se- shells in order to skip that tile. Or maybe you want to leave it hanging out for somebody else so they have to spend to get that tile. So when a certain amount of event tiles have come out and been resolved, that will end the game. I don't know what your thoughts are. Do you think it's like a civilization game like they were saying? Uh, I don't think so, but I think I kind of see where they were going. I liked this game, actually. At first, I was a bit concerned. I'm like, oh, maybe it's too simplistic. Not that there's anything wrong with a simplistic game. Sometimes those are like the best games. I liked it here, and I liked the, the way the tiles worked for you to take actions So that whole having to, if you wanted a tile further down the line that did the action you wanted, you'd have to pay for it. Or, you know, oops, now that I've used it, it moves to the back of the line. So it's not available for that player to use unless they want to pay to use it. So I liked that movement of the tiles. The events I was talking about, oh, those ruin everybody's plans. Well, it could be good, but sometimes not beneficial. You're like, oh, I guess I could take it, but you're wasting an action. Maybe I can force somebody else to do it. I like the fact that you had to kind of think about it, right? Strategically. Maybe you had to pay for it. Well, it's either that or take something, you know, terrible later on down the line. So I, I like the events because it's a bit of a surprise. So it really might have changed up how you were working with things. But I like that in a game. So events were good. We also noticed that, you know, having lots of babies and strength in this game were good strategies because a lot of the events were based on whoever has the least amount of strength, something bad happens to you. So strength was something that was really important. Me- now, both having lots of babies, so you can spread them out on your board when you have your tiles. Both are good strategies, not necessarily winning, because the last game I played, I didn't have as many population, but I had a lot of tiles, and I was just able to move them around more strategically, and I had a really good win. So I like the fact that different ways of playing can work. Completing tiles, this is where it gets, can be luck of the draw, right? You don't know. The first tiles are always obvious when you see them. The objectives is the ones I'm talking about in the columns. The first ones are flipped up. The ones after that are not. So it's one of those things where, again, you have to adjust what you're doing because maybe you don't have the tiles now. It's kind of forcing you to say, okay, I need to take these tiles in order to complete this objective because it only turns over when you've completed a tile underneath it. So it's like, surprise, now we're going to send you in this direction to do something. For some people, they like that. Other people, if you want to plan, don't necessarily like that element of surprise. Good play time on this one. 45 minutes. I could actually probably play this in the lunch hour. Once you get the rules down and you play with someone who knows the game... Sure. It plays rather quickly, and I like that. Doesn't wear out its welcome. So to me, that was really important. I enjoyed that. You definitely have to rely in this game on reacting and adapting to the situation rather than kind of sabotaging, if that makes sense. So you have to see what other people are doing, right? Because they're affecting that action line that you're taking from. So you got to pay attention mm-hmm. to that. Yeah. And I find sometimes not everybody is very comfortable or okay with playing with reacting. I personally am that type of player. I react. So I don't necessarily plan, oh, perfect, That's we're going to go this way. That happened, I'm going to do that. So if that's not something like, I don't know if you're going to like that element here. But for players like me who may be that tactical, no, I like to react as things happen. You may enjoy that aspect of the game. So overall, 
I really enjoyed it. I think you should give it a shot. This is a reprint. I've never played the original, but apparently there are some significant changes in this version. Have you played the previous no. version? Oh, yeah. No, I have not. Okay. What are your thoughts on this one, Suzanne? I liked it too. I have not played it. I think I've played it once, okay. maybe twice. I No, I think I've played it twice, but uh, no, I liked it too. I, I agree with you. It's relatively quick once you get into it. I really actually like that rotating action line. Mm-hmm. I The way that you can pay to skip things to get to the action you want. And I think that that worked quite well. And trying to figure out the puzzle of the tiles that you get in front of you. I will say drawing the tiles from the bag was frustrating at times for me. I do remember that I was desperate to get a certain type of terrain and I just couldn't get it. And I found that frustrating. And yes, you can adapt your plan. I think maybe it was on me that I waited too long to adjust. I kept on trying to get the tile I needed and should have switched my plan earlier and I didn't. But overall, I, I enjoy it too. I like that rotating action line a lot. And any game that gives you kind of a full meal deal in a quick game. Yeah. I always kind of enjoy. So I'm with you on that one for sure. Yeah. So definitely I think Tribes Dawn of Humanity, it's one that if you haven't tried it out, I think you should give it a go. Well, for the game I'm going to chat about, I always pick up, no matter what, the two-player Lookout Spiel line of games. Lookout Spiel comes out with two-player game. I'm going to get it. Cosmos comes out with their two-player line. I'm going to get it. It's just the way my brain operates. I love these two-player games. Some of them have missed, but many, many, many of them hit. And so Mandala just came out recently. This is designed by Trevor Benjamin and Brett J. Gilbert. The art is by Clemens Franz. And as mentioned, it's published by Lookout Spiel. It retails for $30 in the U.S. And... As you can understand, this is two-player only, and it's going to play in about 30 minutes once you know the rules. And if you don't know the rules, it's going to play in like 40 minutes. So it's (laughs) pretty predictable and pretty quick. In Mandala, you get a big old stack of square cards and a fabric board. You get this printed canvas, like, I don't know if canvas is the right word, but it's a fabric board. And it's got two kind of big circles printed on it that represent your mandalas. And you each get a a row that has squares on it indicating where you're going to be putting cards later. So you have the mandalas and then you have your row in front of you that's called your river. And then there's a little spot at the end of your river called the cup. And what happens is in the mandala, there are six colors possible. And the cards have a pattern to them as well. They're fairly complex patterns. They're very pretty. They're mandalas, uh, which are you know often made from sand and things like that. So they're fairly intricate. I don't know how friendly or not this is to colorblind players mm-hmm. because they are all unique, but there's so much going on. I don't know if that's helpful or not. But you have six colors of cards. And in a mandala, there is a... Imagine a circle with a stripe running down the middle. And the semicircle on your side is your field, and the semicircle on my side is my field. And then you have that big strip in the middle. That's called the mountain. (laughs) And what's going to happen is you're going to be taking turns playing cards to one of the two mandalas. You can pick which one you do. And I can play to the mountain, or I can play to my side of the field, to my field. And Mandy, you can play to your field and to the mountain, but we can't ever play across fields, so to speak. What you're doing is you're playing cards and then you're trying to complete mandalas. And you complete it when the sixth color is added to the mandala anywhere. So if there's red and green in the mountain, I cannot duplicate colors in another area. So I cannot play red or green in a field. Once it's in the mountain, it's off limits anywhere else. Or if I have orange in the field, I can never play orange to the mountain. So I'm playing cards trying to arrange it so eventually the sixth color is played. And then you've completed the mandala. And the way this works is it's majority. So whoever has the most cards in their field in the completed mandala gets to keep cards from the mountain. So more cards in my field, I get to take cards from the mountain. And it's kind of a back and forth draft. So if there's uh, three colors in there, I get my first pick, you get a pick, and then I get my the last card. So that's what you're doing. You're playing cards, completing mandalas. You want to have the most cards on your field so that when it's completed, you get to take the best or optimal cards from the mountain. Now, how do those cards get out there? Well, you have a few actions you can choose from. You can play one card of your choice to the mountain. And remember, the cards that go into the mountains are the ones that you can get later to score. 
And if you play to the mountain, you can draw up to three cards. That's good because you want that hand flexibility. Or you can play as many cards as you want to a field in the same color. So I can play two red cards, three red cards, four red cards, five red cards, however many I have. I can drop them down there if I want to. But you don't get to draw back up. And then you can also discard cards and draw new ones as well. That's an action too, in case you just feel like you're stuck. And that alone, that decision on, ugh, do I want more, I need more cards, but I don't want to play to the mountain or I have the wrong color or what you want to do. It leads to some really tense moments, which is really, really cool. Now, what do you do with the cards that you get? Well, you have that river I mentioned earlier, and that actually forms your scoring row. And I really like this about the game. So the first time you get a color card, it goes into the first spot on the far left and you're going to work your way down the river. So maybe I get a black card first. Great. A black one goes into the river. Every other black card I get after that goes into my cup for end game scoring. Great. Next, the next color I manage to pick up is a red. That goes into the second spot. And then every other red card I get for the rest of the game goes into my cup for scoring. And so on and so forth. So you want to get these cards. You want to get a nice mix of them so that you fill up your river with lots of cards so that you can score off of any color. More importantly, the later you get a color, the more points it will score. So the cards that you get first, so if I, in this example, the black cards I took early are going to be worth one point each. The fifth color you take is worth five points each. So it's far better to have lots of cards in the color that you take end game. But managing that timing is really, really thoughtful and strategic in many ways. And I think that is also very awesome. You keep on playing until somebody completes the river or until you drain the deck. You reveal your cup. You spread out your cards. You count out how many you have. You do the multiplication for, for scoring and the person with the most points wins. It's really simple. In fact, it's probably easier to teach when you have the game in front of you than even the explanation I've given now. It's quite simple to teach because you have cards in front of you that you can show examples of as opposed to trying to communicate it in a podcast. It's colorful. It's light, but you are making interesting decisions. You can form strategies. The fact that there's two mandalas that you can play between adds that extra layer of strategy and and flexibility so that you don't feel trapped. You feel like you always have a decision and a choice to make. This is a charmer. This is an absolute winner in the Lookout Spiel two-player line. They did a fabulous job with the game. The thing I I dislike in the game, shuffling all the cards. (laughs) That's literally the worst part of the That's game to so me is having to shuffle that big deck of square cards. <laughs> oh, they're square. Ooh, yeah, okay. I can see that yeah. being a problem. But I mean, honestly, that's the biggest thing I can pick about on this game. So it's a pretty darn good game. I'm so glad I got it. If you get to play two player games at all and you want something that fills that quick but satisfying slot in your docket, I recommend Mandala highly. Yeah, I remember I see this one at... Uh... Essen, if I'm not mistaken. I was contemplating it, and then I saw it was only two-player, which normally I'd like, but I have so many two-player games that I'm not getting played. Is it like, yes, you need to have this on your shelf as a two-player game? Uh, it's it's tough. Okay. It is one, I would say also Mandala would be great. Mandala's the type of game, somebody hasn't played many, if any, board games, I... hobby board games before. This is the type of game you could bring to them, sit down and teach them, and they would get it. Got it. So I I really, really, really like it. I will say that for sure. I'll, I've already played it a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And I'm still finding if a person comes early to game night or something, I'm like, hey, you want to play Mandala? So it's a keeper. It's a keeper, Mandy. If, if you can get two player games to the table, it's a keeper. All right. I might have to try this one out. Well, we have lots more games that we've played, but... Today will not be the day that we talk about them. We'll store them up for the next episode. But we do have one quick app each to talk about, I think. Right, Mandy? Yes, absolutely. And now let's look at the digital side of board game with Tap That App. Okay, so I feel like it's been a while since we've done an app or... Well, not really. Has it? I don't know. I feel like well, it has. Well, we do. It's really been at least a month because we try to alternate what we chat about, right? So you're right. It has been a little bit of time. Okay. Well, since, you know, I've been at home, you know, it's been 
kind of like, okay, what apps do I play? I just went crazy online and Nintendo Switch, Android, Steam, all the all the things. So I've decided to pick one that I've been playing quite a bit, actually, because it's so quick, is uh, Six Nymphed or Six Takes. I, I should really know what Six is in German. This is terrible. I will learn this for next episode. Because <laughs> I literally just gave the German title and I said Six in English. I'm slapping my wrist. Shame on Mandy. Okay, so six takes or six nymphed. It's uh, it says it's designed by Application Systems Heidelberg, a software GmbH, and it's available on iOS and Android. I did do a search. I didn't see it available on the Nintendo Switch, but maybe I'm no, interested. not that I know. Of. Okay, maybe one day. Oh uh, yes, I'm just checking. You know, the aim of the game is to avoid getting cards. Right? Sounds like every other game, but it kind of reminds me of like trick taking where you don't want to try and get cards you know where certain games oh is it not not cards but basically bad cards and i'll explain what i mean so each card that you have to take up it basically costs you points so there's bullheads on the cards when you're placing cards out in the app you know yeah place they have to be in like a numerical order and there's i'm if i'm not mistaken i think it's three there's four rows of cards that you can place in for example if i decide to put out a 10 right but there are cards already out in each of these rows that have started it off. So one could be 75, one could be two, one could be 30. You don't know. The game puts them out there. So I've decided, hey, I'm going to put out, I'll put out a card that says 12. And then the, the computer or whoever you're playing against puts out a card that says, you know, 75. They now put the cards in the corresponding order in the row. So usually there's enough space. However, once the row gets full and you look at your hand and you're like, oh, shoot, the card that I got to put out next potentially could make me pick up a row of cards, which is bad because each of the cards have bullheads on them. It could be one. It could be two. It could be five on each card. Like you don't, you know, you'll see it when you put the cards out and you don't want that. But when you draw your card and then the other person goes, you're praying that maybe they'll get it first and then you don't have to pick up those cards and yours can just go safely into that now newly empty row. (laughs) So basically... The fewest bullheads you have or the fewest cards with bullheads on them will win the game. Does that make sense? It kind of reminds me of, is it spades I'm thinking of? What's the, anyway, it's one of those trick-taking games where you have negative uh, points on the cards I'm thinking yep. of. Well, I mean, certainly in spades, you're bidding sure. on how many tricks you get. And if you take too many, you can get sandbags and then right. sandbags make you lose points. And yeah, so absolutely. So, yeah, I think because I played a lot of trick taking when I'm growing up. So maybe that's why I'm like, oh, I kind of get the feel for this one. Yes, it kind of reminds me of that a little bit. In the app, Six Takes, I usually play against the the computer or the, you know, the AI. And in this game, I think it only allows you to play to four So there isn't an option to play to six in this one. I looked, and apparently six is quite the popular number to play this game with normally. But uh, in the app, it only allows four players. There are three levels of difficulty. I've played one and two. I was like, yeah, there's no way. I can't even win properly on two. So three is for those professional players. The tutorial is rather interactive. I did do it just for fun, just to see how it plays through. It's very straightforward. I mean, it explains the game as as you're playing. And I mean, like I said, the game is not difficult. So once you get into it, you're like, okay, I got this. And then you can try a game on your own pretty quickly. Uh, you can extend the length of the game. So the game, I usually play the short ones if I want something quick, but you can do the first to 66 negative points. Mm-hmm. I've played that yep. one before. Um, but when you play that one, I find on the screen, and maybe this is in general, I don't find the screen is used well in that game. Mm -hmm. So depending now I played on my phone. And the reason I bring this up is because if I'm holding my phone normally, how if I was making a call or texting, it's not bad, it fills the screen. As soon as you turn the phone into that landscape mode, everything gets really small. And then Mm -hmm. the sides of the screen are really empty, like there's nothing there. I get it that they kind of to lay it out like that, but then it makes like the bullheads really small to see. The cards are really hard to see. So it's almost like you're forced to play in that kind of portrait mode, which is fine, but I think a lot of us are more comfortable in the other way. So I just wish they had used the real estate a little bit better uh, right. in that in that kind of setup. But overall, it's a simple looking game. It's a simple game in general, but it's popular. There's a reason because it's quick and fun. So overall, I liked the app. Like I said, little things like maybe expanding out the real estate a little bit, using that a bit better in the game. But I mean, the tutorial is great. It's very straightforward. I like that. And I like the fact that you can amp up the difficulty or play in like more pro modes to make it more fun or difficult. So overall, uh, six takes or six nymphs for me is a win in the app, and I've been playing it quite a bit. I'm glad you like it. I've played it in the app a bunch too. 
it's definitely a game I enjoy playing in larger groups. I like to carry it with me and play it at conventions and things like that. I think the app does a good job. It definitely shows its age. It's been out for a number sure. of years and it was fairly basic. And I think that that's some of what you're hitting is that it doesn't have some of the responsive structuring right. for landscape versus portrait mode. But certainly if you are laid up ill, it is a wonderful <laughs> time filler. It sure. is. I've, I'm, you would think I'd be better at it, but no, I just keep losing. <laughs> well, you can also try the app I'm about to talk about, Mandy, because if nothing else, it's free to download and try. So oh, there you go. Free. Mm. I like this. Tell me more. Good. <laughs> Two Spies is an app. Unfortunately, I say that, Mandy, but now I'm going to tease you. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's iOS only right now. Oh, so just for the iPad. Darn. For you, yes. For but it's I, it pl- I play it on my phone, but it's iOS only. I'm so sorry. I wish, I hope that they come out with more versions, certainly for Android at least. And it is free to download and it has what I think is very reasonable IAP. Two Spies is a technically two-player game, kind of a game of cat and mouse, a little bit of deduction, a little bit of trying to have hidden movement and some action management going on. Now, the app itself has a solo mode, so you can play against three different levels of AI, and I've been exploring those, and I think that they're decent AIs overall. There's great pass and play mode, and then you can play online as well. So that's that's the modes of play you have there. Unfortunately, they don't have the rules just that you can access and read, and I really wish it did. Mm -hmm. It does have a very nice tutorial. This is not a board game. This is an app that clearly pulls on traditional board game mechanisms. I should lead with that. Two Spies is similar to the way I've talked about Slay the Spire before. It's just not a a physical board game, but Mm. it well fits into what I would determine a digital board game would be. There are no rules in it because I think it shows that it's not a originally a physical game. It does have a great tutorial, though. And basically, you get a map with dots on certain cities and then lines connecting them. So those are your paths between different cities. And some cities branch off and go to multiple cities. Some don't, that kind of thing. Picture a ticket to ride board, mm, really, in a okay. sense. That's kind of what you're dealing with, except not with little multiple spots in between. And you have a little pin as if you're pinning into a map. And your opponent has a little pin as well. And on your turn, you get to take two actions. And those actions are basically move, attack, or hide, or control. Because you gain intelligence points as you control cities. So you want to control cities because you get all this intelligence points. And then you can use those intelligence points to activate special actions and special abilities like discovering your opponent's hideout and that kind of thing. But when you control a city, it reveals your location, making it easier for your opponent to come in and get (laughs) you. So it really is very strategic in looking at where you are, where your opponent is or may be, figuring out which action is the right one to take at the time, which city you want to move to. Do you want to take the hide action and hunker down so that your opponent no longer knows where you are? Do you want to take one of the special actions? That means every time your opponent tries to attack you in the wrong place, you find out where they are and manage your intel points that kind of way. Eventually, you want to go around and get control of a bunch of area or you want to strike your enemy and find them. (laughs) Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) You just keep on doing that. You can set it to play one game, two games, you know, best out of three, best out of four, best out of five, whatever. You can pick how many rounds you go. That's kind of it. The IAP I mentioned just lets you customize your pins. They have all these cute little pins. There's one, Mandy, with little cat ears. It's a pink pin. It's just this little diamond-shaped pin, but it has little cat ears on it, and it's pink. That's You know, they have a spy pin with sunglasses and uh, fedora and that kind of thing as well. So you don't need to purchase the extra pins. They're just for kind of flair, and certainly as you're playing, playing pass and play, it's fun to have your own little personalized pin with personality to play with instead, but it's no big deal. So really... The free option's excellent on Two Spies to give it a try on OAOS. I recommend it. I really do enjoy this. It's pretty light, but it's also very quick. And I find certainly on a phone, 
quick games are great because chances are I'm playing it in between doing something else or on a quick break or waiting in line or something like that. So the quickness is actually a benefit. The trade-off is it's not super, super deep, but I think it strikes a very nice balance. Quick, light, entertaining, polished. Two Spies on iOS. It's free. Give it a whirl. Now, now I can add it to the collection of games I'm playing. And I'm going to throw this out there. I know it's not a board game. Suzanne, don't give me a, an evil eye for saying this. But I recently played on my Nintendo Switch. Yes, I'm so excited about it. Cupheads. Oh, my gosh. It's so, it's so hard, cute. though. Um, yeah, and because my nails are long, when I have to do the jump glidey thing, <laughs> it just never works out because you got to do it really fast. I'm like, yeah. But it's just, I love the vintage vibe. Anyway, I digress. I had to throw it out there. There are a few people listening to the podcast had suggested it. Thank you. Good choice. You know me well. everyone so we decided to do another kind of reverse victory points today we will get back to our regular format but uh, the reason why we have a short episode and we're doing this is because i haven't been well so right now i am suffering from a blood clot a lot of people are saying how does that even happen there are a multitude of ways it can happen it could be certain types of medication it could be stuff from just not being active enough there's lots of different reasons that it happens it's very painful. <laughs> and even as we do this podcast, I, you know, I'm having difficulty sitting for long periods of time without getting up and kind of taking breaks because um, I need to get the blood flowing in my leg. So this is not the first one I've had. Uh, I've had one before from an injury. And that one was much worse because it went to my chest. Uh, so this is something that is to be taken very seriously. And in both cases, I had to be rushed to the hospital and for it to be taken care of. And uh, so it is something I'm getting treatment for. I had treatment at that time, but it definitely is something not to ignore. Uh, I am one to do that. So this is why I say, check it out with your doctor if you can. So coming back full circle to what we want to talk about, we want to talk about maybe some things that make us, you know, feel well or comfortable while we're gaming. Maybe things we need to think about, hey, you know what? I got to remind myself to do better at this and, it, it, you know, to make myself feel more comfortable at the gaming table. If Suzanne, if you don't mind, I'll start off because we're going to tie it into my situation. Yeah, please. Yeah. In speaking of blood clots, and please, if there are any medical professionals uh, out there, um, we're going to talk about where you can send your info and questions because I think this is an important topic. Gaming is a it's 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 an activity that's it's a bit sedentary, right? We we sit a lot. It's not just gaming. Even my job, I'm a teacher, but a lot of the time I'm doing administrative work. I'm sitting. As you know, someone who's part of the gaming community, I do videos, we do podcasts. I'm sitting. And these are things that can contribute to things like blood clots because it does tend to happen when we're not as active. Sitting for long periods of time are never good. So these are things we want to avoid. So some things that I'm going to have to start doing now, other than obviously the medication I have to take, is setting a timer. And Suzanne and I were talking about this and she'll talk about it a bit more for what she's going to talk about. But if I'm sitting for, you know, maybe like an hour or so, half an hour, I have to set a timer to say, hey, okay, you know what, I got to get up and walk around. Even at my work, I have a sit-stand station. So now if I'm sitting, I have to stand up for a bit, walk around, get the blood flowing and circulating. And sometimes when we're so engrossed in the game, because I've done it, you haven't stood for what, maybe a quick bathroom break, but you've been sitting for like three hours. Like, it's just you need to get that blood flowing in your body. So the reason why I talk about this is because I've, you know, going through this right now, and I would never want someone to go through this. I'm not saying this is exactly the cause, but it's not helping. So these are things we can kind of do by taking those breaks, kind of reminding each other, hey, you know what? Oh, let's take a, like, a quick break and get back at it, take a walk around, come back to it. There's nothing wrong with that. Game's not going anywhere. So that's just my two cents on that part of it. What about you, Suzanne? Oh, well, as I, we were talking about, well, what it, do we want to discuss this on the podcast? And we said, yeah, we should, because even though you have a fairly specific thing, right. talking about being healthy and, and happy and comfortable while we game... What really called to mind for me was posture mm. and how I hunch. Okay. And hunching is so natural because I work at a computer station, so I find that I'm hunched over my keyboard and it's not ergonomically set up, so I'm sitting upright and have my wrists at the right angles and all that other stuff. Right. And then I definitely find as I'm sitting around the game table that I'm hunched over the board. You're leaning, you're resting, you're bending, and all this other stuff. And honestly, a lot of that's not good for your body. It's not good for your blood flow, like with your situation, Mandy. Right. And it's not good for your joints or for your muscles and just in general. And so similarly, 
that reminder, I, I, I've been wanting to use one of these little reminder apps mm-hmm. that they have. Like, they make them for, hey, stay hydrated. Another good point. Right. Drink lots of water. Absolutely. Right? And just p- to put a reminder, all for game night specifically, bing, sit up. Oh, yeah, I need to do that to kind of help me develop better habits around the table. And I'm sure we all have things that we do that probably aren't the best habit, whether it's eating Cheetos with your fingers in the (laughs) middle of a board game or hunching or sitting too much and not taking breaks between games and standing up and walking around. Quite frankly, I should do that between games, whether I'm whether we have your specific situation or not, Mandy. Absolutely. It's just good for your body. And so we thought it would be interesting to see what you all had to say about being a healthy gamer so that you can be happier and more comfortable when you play the games that we all love. I am also very specifically interested in chairs because Mm -hmm. I think the type of chairs that we have, whether you have hardwood chairs or whether you have to bring seat cushions or whether you have plush chairs, things like that. I know Blue Peg Pink Peg recently bought some really great looking chairs from a church supply store that looked amazing and very comfortable, but very functional at the same time. Mm -hmm. So folks, head on over to the Board Game Geek Guild and to this episode's show notes thread and let us know what some of your top favorite tips and tricks are for being a healthy gamer are, whether it's posture tips or better snacks or getting up, staying hydrated, whatever it is. If you have any kind of tips, I would like to hear what they are so that I can focus on being a happier, healthier, more comfortable gamer over the next year. And maybe this is something we can revisit once we've, you know, received some responses and kind of have a better discussion about it to see what people have suggested. Because like I know for myself, I'm definitely open to a bit more things because I do know I get really focused in what I'm doing and tend to forget things, you know, like posture and and getting up and things like that. So I think even drinking water sometimes, you're just like, oh, yeah, I'm thirsty. Like, you know, by the time your lips are dry and chapped, it's too late. You should have had yes, water. Indeed. <laughs> so, you know, things that we can do for each other, even if you forget, hey, you know, let's, let's have a little break. It's cheesy. I know. But it's important. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. And so what? If it's cheesy, but it's better for you, who cares? Exactly. And honestly, folks, with that, we're going to call it an episode. You, Mandy and I Skype when we record, and I can see her on camera. I know you can't, but this poor woman is really uncomfortable recording this. I can tell. And so, Mandy, let's take mercy on you and call it a show. Much appreciated. If anybody has questions to find out more about, you know, what I'm kind of working through, please, like, don't be afraid to ask. I love talking about that stuff. My mom's a nurse, so I ask her a ton of questions and I can relay the information to you. So, yeah, we can give you all our uh, That's really nice content. to be open. No, of course, because I understand and sometimes people don't know, and I would definitely not want someone to wait if you have these symptoms. Please, please, please don't wait. If you have questions related to board games or conventions or anything around that zone, feel free to email us. We'll have a Q&A session on the podcast coming up. You can send me questions at Suzanne at Dicetower.com. And you can send questions or anything to me, Mandy, that's Mandy with an I, at Dicetower.com. As always, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for bearing with us on today's episode. We know it's a little unusual, and we really thank you for your patience and understanding on that front. Don't forget that the Dice Towers Kickstarter is still live through January 31st. Check it out. Every dollar helps support the Dice Tower. Hey, if you want to pick up some really cool dice, that awesome upcoming playmat or some of the promo packs, maybe you'll find something there that you really, really like. So don't forget to take a look at that. Up next episode, 642, Tom and Eric link up to look at their favorite L games. Mm. And until then, everybody, I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Andy Hutchinson. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Basil Memorial Fund is an organization dedicated to helping gamers in need. Learn more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackbasil.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Suzanne, Mandy, and Eric, with assistance from Roy Kennedy and Rob Searing. 
Our theme is composed by Timothy Pinkham and arranged by Matt Bellier. And hosting is provided by Cool Stuff Inc. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. All right, everyone, it's that time for Two Truths and a Lie, so let's jump right in. So my reveal from the last episode, let's start. My streaming setup is pink-themed. I have seven portable external hard drives, and I built my own computer. So if you said I built my own computer was the lie, you would be correct. I had it built, but I didn't build it. I had my lovely friend Jose build it for me. <laughs> Hey, Thanks when you say. have friends with skills, take advantage of it. Exactly. <laughs> From last episode, I said I've finished Halo, I've finished Mario Odyssey, and I've finished Link's Awakening. And the lie is that I finished Link's Awakening. Okay, you threw me for a loop on this one. I for sure was surprised at Halo. I thought that was going to be it, so well done. <laughs> you are welcome. I loved Halo. And Link's Awakening, I also really enjoy. I just am can't beat the guardians darn it it's huge it's huge i gotta try that one myself so new for this week i have six pairs of glasses i called my gaming collection to 200 games and i have three closets with clothes (laughs) these all three of them crack me up okay so random (laughs) and randomly this week my favorite tea is lapsang souchong i like toasted marshmallows And I love barbecue. Mm -hmm. All right. Good luck, everyone.